Welcome to season two of Possibility Project, a disruption conversation series where changemakers talk about the big questions we need to answer now. This is our second episode in our second season and our 12th episode since the pandemic started from our first um, episode. And if you missed any others, we invite you to check them out on our brand new website, possibilityproject.org. I'm happy to share the link in the chat. I'm going to multitask. And my name is Devin Davey. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm going to use the Zoom introduction guidelines that were passed along to us by our, our former speaker, Possibility Project speaker, Nova Wren from Genesis Healing Institute. And um, he, you're welcome to access it and use it as well. I will also add the link in the chat. Um, and essentially what I wanna to talk to you about is the uh, do a land acknowledgement. So um, we, I am currently on a land that is held and kept secret by the Ohlone people, um, the Ohlone uh, community. And I wanna share a, just a note on territory acknowledgements that they are one small piece of disrupting and dismantling the colonial structures. And if you wanna learn more about how this lightly touches the surface of power and privilege, uh, I'm gonna share another link in the chat um, about land acknowledgement. And for folks who are differently abled uh, visually, I'd like to share a description of myself. I am a white woman with tan skin and dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. And I'm wearing a green soft sweater and there's a, a green calla lily type plant to the left of the screen that's um, that is my nature representation and uh, today we're going to have a transcript of today's episode um, following all of um, following all of what's said we will be able to share that transcript out through a service called otter to you all after this conversation as needed. So again, I'm Devin Davey. I'm a strategy management consultant and I help uh, social entrepreneurs, founders and CEOs get unstuck by co-designing and implementing people and process solutions. And my colleague and co-creator, Heather Hiscox, is the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. And she works with nonprofits, philanthropic foundations and local governments to help them address and pursue opportunities in less time using fewer resources and achieving greater impact. So uh, Heather and I started this project, uh, Possibility Project when COVID hit, and we were dreaming about reimagining the social sector. So here are our goals for Possibility Project. Um, we wanna unite a community of change makers, stimulate new thinking and a thirst for deeper change, explore collaboratively what's possible, and then we added this last role um, last summer in 2020, which is examining our own role in transformation, starting with ourselves. So really doing a lot of the deeper inner work that we know is needed to be effective leaders in the social sector. So um, following the agenda slide, um, or following our goal slide, I wanna talk a little bit about the agenda. Um, and you'll see it's a quick run of show. Very quickly, I'm gonna turn it over to George, who's gonna take us away for most of the conversation. Um, and he's gonna give us a bit of an overview around what the gut, gut check tool is, why it was created. And we're gonna work in Miro. Some of you all have experience with Miro, some of you don't. It's a quick learning. Um, you'll jump into it really quickly. You don't need any um, you don't need to create a profile or sign in. You can uh, edit as a guest, which is what we will have you do. And then we're going to talk about the following um, episodes that we have for Possibility Project. So moving to George, um, George A was a previous guest and speaker on one of our episodes around consultants. And we talked about dismantling or enabling the status quo, which is a topic that we heard a lot of folks in our ne network being really interested in as far as this client consultant kind of power dynamic and you know what it is that as consultants and designers, we are not and aren't able to do. And after that conversation, a lot of folks really wanted to dive into 
how do you do a gut check around working with clients as a designer and consultant or founder or you know somebody who's hiring um, consultants in any way? Um, and so we we did a lot of um, exploration and and George's shared with us a methodology that his firm, George is the director of innovation and the co-founder of Greater Good Studio that he and Sarah Cantor have been developing and using for years. Um, the, the firm has been around for, I want to say almost 10 years. George, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And um, really what we want to talk to you about today is how we reclaim our power as consultants, designers, implementers, and social change makers. Um, and what's special about this episode is that it's really more of a workshop in this season two of Possibility Project. It's not just talking about theory. So uh, I'm excited to get you all into this and I want to do a bit of an introduction to George. Um, I'm going to put his bio in the chat and you can read all about his fantastic experience. And, um, and I think one way that we really want to get to know people and share uh, stories is by asking a fun tidbit and sharing a fun tidbit about someone. So I'm going to turn it over to you, George. And since some of us opened our introductions with our name and where we're coming from, calling in from and our favorite food or recipe, the same question goes to you. I want to keep that thread going of what's your favorite food that you've either cooked or eaten recently and why? Yeah, uh, well, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can I just check? Yes. Uh, I'm George. I'm the co-founder uh, and director of innovation at Greater Go Studio. Um, I'm based here in Chicago. Um, it's cold. Uh, I've been doing a lot of winter baking. Uh, I finally got myself a, um, I think a stand mixer, I think that's what it's called. So in order to justify the purchase of a stand mixer, I am baking a lot of cookies. And I found a, I'll put it in the chat later, but I found a particularly good uh, cookie recipe, which they claim to be the best one because they figured out there's like a combination of like bread flour, regular flour, brown butter, this, it's nuts. It's just such, such a consistently good recipe. So I've been doing that a lot. Um, shall, I, shall, I keep, shall I keep going? Okay, good. So uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Heather uh, and Devon, for hosting me uh, and getting me access to this wonderful community of folks at uh, Possibility Project. Uh, there are still people rolling in, but uh, I actually recognize a number of folks uh, on the call, which is so thrilling to be able to see. I don't know if it makes me more nervous or less nervous to see people that I recognize, but it's sort of, um, it's just always fun. And there's folks from all over the world, which is mind blowing. All right, so um, I want to check firstly, technology wise, can this screen share work? Please, please, please work because we were having some issues with it earlier. Do you see a yes. keynote frame? Oh, thank God. Okay, I'm gonna now make sure that this, okay. Wonderful. So uh, I'll be uh, going back and forth a little between uh, Zoom and the screen share that's in Keynote as well as into Miro. Um, Heather, Devin, do you have the link to the Miro? I will add it to the chat right now. Yeah. Now we won't need it immediately, but we're going to need it soon, and we'll share it again soon enough. Great. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm uh, one of the founding team members of Greater Good Studio. Uh, we've been here in Chicago for almost ten years, and uh, our work exclusively uh, is with nonprofit, foundation, and government clients. Uh, we chose uh, to do this because we saw that the kind of work that I typically see in doing design work for nonprofits. Uh, tended to have this really, real funny phenomenon of like it was always a favor we were doing or perhaps if we did projects with the social sector it was in between projects for Starbucks or Macy's let's say so I felt like that was a very uh, odd combination of like, a, like an odd narrative that I wanted to disrupt and try to see if we could make a full-time project or full-time business that only worked on the things that would have otherwise been this sort of like favor um, across that time, uh, because we've stayed issue agnostic, we've been able to work across uh, over 150 projects over the last 10 years. And in that time, we, you know, worked on anything from tenants' rights to educational advocacy, uh, uh, transformations within the school, donor engagement, childhood trauma, uh, power analysis, sexual teen health, uh, so many different topic areas. But because of all those ranges, we noticed a couple of patterns about the things that we've been doing. Uh, and one of those was the need for something called a gut check. So our gut check right now, um, it, you know, started as a series of questions. Um, partly the question primarily was just like, why do I feel so weird about this? 
Has anyone started a project and you can already tell that it feels weird? Anybody have a phenomenon like that? And part of the question is, what is translated between your body? I don't know if you need to use the words like somatic practice, although that's a recent new uh, piece of language and vocabulary for me. But I noticed as someone who would pay attention to my body thing, I feel really uncomfortable doing this project. And as soon as I hear about it, this is making me feel bad. So the question was, how do I translate that almost physical phenomena that showed up in my body into a set of repeatable questions? And my, while we might call it a rubric of sorts, um, which sounds fancy than it really is, it's just trying to make consistent the practice of asking questions to answer, why do I feel weird? That's it. Um, and you know, we wrote a blog post about this and, and these questions are fine. They're not necessarily for, for you per se, but the whole point of this workshop is for you to develop the questions yourself so that you can start getting to a habit of asking and translating physical phenomena in your body into things that are repeatable. And ideally you can even do them with team members. So what we had to figure out, considering we were looking at a gut check and developing this, how do you do business development in a sector that is not known for having lots of money? The other sectors that I had worked in were known for having more money, which is why there was an enormous number of people who would work in that area. But if you think of business development as we started to learn how to do it, we realized that we needed to work out a different almost approach, not only to how we did the practice of business development, which is kind of what led us towards having a new gut check, but treating the very approach itself and thinking of it less about how do we make perhaps money for this quarter, but rather treat it as how do we conserve the energy we have knowing that who we dedicate it to has to be done with care and, and sort of deliberation. So when we think about the idea of uh, energy conservation, I take great I feel like a real um, duty to be a steward of both myself, my co-founder, and a now a 10-person, well, it's a 12-person full-time team. So I feel like that is my job, is to conserve the energy of our team, to not waste it on bozos. And there are lots of those around. I'm sure there are many people on this call who feel like they are wasting their energy on bozos. And in doing so, it is exhausting. Anybody have that phenomena? It seems to take two to three times longer than anything should because of just how, um, how such a bad fit. So if you think of it that way, then the question becomes, how do I be more selective about the energy I conserve and to which end and to whom do we serve it towards? So I'm gonna bring this attention now to the Miro. Um, I see there are just a few handful of folks over there, but I wanna do a quick tensions exercise in Miro. Uh, so I'm gonna stop the screen share uh, now, and I'm going to try and see if I can get our attention over to the mirror board. Okay. When I think about new projects coming my way, one end of an extreme says, I feel the pressure to take everything I can versus I feel more confident that more opportunities are going to come. I'm going to lock these, uh, lock that thing. There we go. Hopefully it shouldn't move around too much. Could you please grab a post-it note and position it where you feel uh, is resonant with you. There are no wrong answers here, absolutely. No one's gonna get shamed for taking a position. Uh, you just can't put it in the middle because that's cheating. Please let me know, you know take yourself off mute if you're getting stuck or not sure or simply like can't keep up with where we are because I, I, I know there's a lot of things going on at the same time. George, why is putting it in the middle cheating? Because you're not choosing one or the other? Yes. And you nor I have learned anything from it. It may be true that you're in the middle all the time, but I'd rather you took a position. I think usually folks can take a position if forced. All right, so there's quite a wide distribution of answers here. So as folks are still putting in their answers, can I see if someone put themselves on the far left on the, I feel the pressure to take something, to take everything I can, if you've proud yourself on that far left, could you take yourself off mute and maybe share a little about why you placed your post-it there? This is Dan Kaskabar in Denver, Colorado. And I'll just Hi. share that I just started a business. Mm. And so as someone who's just started, I put my uh, post-it over there because I need all the business I can get. <laughs> and, and more specifically, you feel a pressure to do so. I feel a pressure to do so because I uh, inherently feel the pressure of feeding five mouths. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very real fear and a very, very real pressure. Hey, George, it's Natalie Long. Hi. I just thought I'd say quickly that um, 
unlike the, the first speaker, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. Um, my partner is the breadwinner in our house. And mm -hmm. so I've done a lot of work over the past few years over my purpose and my values. And so um, at the same time, I haven't been able to find paid work of late. So I'm on left of center, um, but I'm also really intentional about the things I try to get or do. You know, they have to, to pretty much align. Um, and I'm having to go off that a little bit to, mm -hmm. you know, for-profit business work, mm -hmm. but still keeping that thread that it needs to be mission aligned with something I care about. Great. It's Great. a luxury and a privilege to be able to say that. So I admit that as well. That's I okay. Can, um, yeah. um, you know, full time, <laughs> but I'd really like to be working. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we find is that throughout this workshop, we're going to be identifying moments where it feels like, am I lucky to do this? Should I feel bad about this? I think it, whatever you're feeling is perfectly valid for you. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of narratives around how one might ought to feel uh, around doing work that is paid that I found to be pretty challenging. And I've had to sort of work out what is my relationship to those feelings first, and then work out why I want to do it differently. Um, I'm curious if anybody else on this call now has placed themselves on the far right, on the I feel confident there's more opportunities to come. Uh, Dan, uh, George, that was where I Hi. placed myself. And that's, a, that's kind of a new, a new feeling for us in our business. Um, we, we have been uh, consciously moving there as a company. Mm -hmm. So we've been, you know, Dan, I read that, that feeling of having, you know, employees who were, who count on me for their income is very present. And at the same time, we have seven years of evidence that the jobs come, that the income comes, even though it is cyclical, it is up and down. Um, you know, we're not just starting out anymore. And we are kind of consciously moving into a space where we're like, okay, we can be more um, we can choose what we say no to, and we can focus on, we can be mindful about what we say no to and, and choose to define ourselves and our brand by what we say no to. Um, and is it Sarah Joy? Is that right? Yes. Uh, Sarah Joy, can I be cheeky? Can I ask, where would you have put yourself when you first started? Oh, all the way at the right. <laughs> <laughs> Rather. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it's helpful to note that wherever you are right now may change uh, that given more time, perhaps more practice or simply an attitude of just like, I think I can, um, mm -hmm. whether it's privilege or uh, a, a certain kind of comfort that comes with, with doing certain work, who knows, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be fluid. Um, and I think I'm going to keep moving us to the next exercise, if that's okay. So I'm going to slide us over to the right of this. If, if you're working in sort of X, Y space with me, I'm going to unhide this next one. And it's a slightly different question. If I were to say no, I'm confident I will face and two awkward choices, some retaliation or a reputation for being difficult versus praise and support from my peers and colleagues. Could you grab a post-it please and place yourself uh, somewhere on that spectrum? And George, can they also put themselves in the middle for this one? Nope. Thanks for checking, Devin. <laughs> Man, Devin's good. You could be very, very close to the center, but just on one side of it would help. So I see a lot of people taking their positions here. Again, equally spread out. So interesting cluster to the right already that seems to be happening, present support. I'm curious if anybody is on the far right uh, that could speak up to maybe why they uh, place themselves over there. I'll say something. I've, uh, hi everyone. Oh, could you, could you, could you, wonderful, yeah, introduce yourselves, please. Thanks. She, yeah, Aisha, she, her. Um, I put myself there because I've done a lot of um, work around disrupting and pushing back. And I launched my practice in March of last year. So I'm fairly new. Um, but I was very intentional about doing that. And I've received a ton of positive response. Um, I think it might be situated in the moment. I'm a black person. So I think there's a lot of um, shifting um, tolerance and, and respect. And 
like feeling like that's what you should do. You should give black bodies space and respect. And so I think that's probably showing up in it too. Mm. Why it's worked for me as someone who just launched a practice in March. Yeah, the timing is uh, never an ideal time. Uh, there's never a good time to start a business and kind of go completely out, stick your neck out. But a pandemic is a tough moment to do it in for sure. Aisha, I think it's interesting that you know this sort of like perhaps the context in which you're launching might also play a factor and the sort of like the cultural moment it, it, it's in. Um, do you think perhaps if you hadn't done that, let's say a year or two prior, would their response have been different? I don't know how you could know that for sure, but do you think it could have been? Yeah, I can't know that for sure, but I suspected a little you know there have been so many calls right and like rfps and rfqs like wanting to interrogate your practices and the ways white supremacy shows up and so it's Mm -hmm. you know there's more um work happening around that and shifting in that way now than a few years ago so i suspect might have been different yeah i've noticed that there has been uh an increased appetite uh that seems disproportionate with the actual willingness to do anything, but definitely interest for sure, uh, which is, I think, very encouraging. Uh, is anybody on the far left-hand side, there's some reputation, I'm sorry, some retaliation or reputation for being difficult. Uh, that word is chosen with some care because in some contexts, being difficult is what you're trying to avoid. Uh, there is a racial context in which the word can mean quite disastrous things for one's career. Uh, but I guess I'm curious if anybody has placed themselves on the left-hand side and we're willing to share a little. George, um, this is Andrew Plumley. He, him. Hi. Um, I I place myself on on the left, um, and I and I think that um, I'm I'm a director of um, equity and inclusion. So some of my role is to be difficult and always be the person saying the thing. Good for you. Um, and so I think um, I'm I'm always feeling that where we take money from, how we take money, and determining. Um, and I also think that just like with Aisha, what Aisha said around the um, kind of prominence of diversity, equity, inclusion work, the kind of language shifting around white supremacy, there will be money coming in right now. Um, that might not always be the case, but I do think that I'm um, very uh, aware of when I'm being the difficult one and who is framed as difficult and who is not. So I think identity definitely plays a role um, in this particular question, like you said, but um, I'm feeling that often right right now because of the money flowing in specific directions to specific organizations um, around particularly DEI, race equity, uh, anti-racist work. And Andrew, if I could ask a little more, is, it beca- is the phenomena of saying being difficult, let's say in quotes, come from having you say no or like giving your input on, on direction forwards towards something? Yes, I, I think um, specifically making sure we're slowing down to hopefully have some real conversations around why we might want to take this. Mm. Are we the people to take this? Um, are there better ways in which we can bring more voices or BIPOC folks to the table to then actually, I work for a white led organization. So like, we just have to be careful about what that is. And then also, have we done the internal work ourselves to be able to then actually do the programmatic work externally to uh, kind of walk the walk the walk? Um, so it's I think it's difficult. I think it's probably I think they would probably say annoying. Yeah. <laughs> but I also you know I think there's kind of both of those things happening. Thank you. I think what we're going to be hearing on, although I'm not going to speak on it here because I've spoken on other in others in the past, but there are so many components of white supremacy culture that show up in most places it'd be amazing if we wouldn't show up here Uh, but there are components to how when we do this work in building a gut check that's quite disruptive towards how white supremacy culture shows up uh, which is why it's going to be um, challenging uh, and more challenging depending on where you're coming from uh, to to do that uh, to present that alternative um, stance 
Uh, technically, there's one more exercise, but I think I, I want to kind of get back to the slides because I think we've kind of made some points here. And to a degree, um, some of the warm up that these exercises provide us is mostly just so we can get comfortable with Miro. So thank you for everyone who spoke up. I um, also want to bring attention to the chat. There's some amazing support systems already showing up in the chat. So almost anything that anyone says, there's lots of plus ones. Uh, so I encourage folks to be able to contribute and, and speak to this because I think this stuff is uh, this stuff is also important. All right, let me go back to the uh, screen share. My co-founder decided that writing about the gut check and about the process we started developing for ourselves became important because the phenomena and the uh, challenges on the spectrum we faced on a nearly daily basis. Uh, not only were we new, but we were deliberately putting ourselves in harm's way by working with people who are not known for having support systems around design and innovation. But what we found so surprising to us wasn't that it was to help us eliminate a Pepsi from our portfolio, but rather from all of the nonprofit clients who were confused. Has anyone worked with a, with a client that is confused? It makes for very confusing conversations for yourself. And what we found is that the groups who would, uh, who I might have otherwise worked at uh, when I was working at IDEO, simply set, opted out. They never chose us. They just never came our way. So the gut check for us can maybe counted to what we, what we were expected was that they, um, who was calling needed interrogation and those who called were nonprofits, foundations and government. So I didn't expect it to be the case that that was why it was there, but this is how we ended sort of the phenomena that we were reacting to. What we find you see is that who you say yes to builds your portfolio. That seems logical, right? But who you say no to builds your power. It has been so consistent that who we've been able to say no to became a practice, not for them per se, but for yourself. It needed to be something that you could demonstrate that, yes, I have power to be able to say something and that being, being no or being annoying or being difficult um, actually has a, uh, that's a certain sort of like feeling that comes with it that actually goes, wait, I'm allowed to say no? Oh yeah, you're right. And it can actually kind of like disrupt what people are maybe expecting. I've had some clients that go, wait, you can do that. Maybe I can say no. And they kind of forget that, wait, I have an option as well. Maybe this whole thing is a little bit flawed. And I also found that this is, I think it's worth mentioning because I don't have this mindset. I'm now doing a really good impression of someone who has this, but my co-founder is someone who has an, who lives with an abundance mindset. I, perhaps because of my immigrant status and how I grew up in England, has never had that. I've always had a scarcity mindset. And as someone who had grew up like that, I would have found myself on the left-hand side of that first tension and would have said, I have to take everything. Who the hell am I to say no? What are you talking about? And I constantly would be getting into like a fairly, fairly heated conversations with my co-founder around, what are you talking about? How do you have any faith that someone else is gonna call? You're like, how can you know that? And she just says, well, I do. And it's like, I don't understand. That logically doesn't even make sense. And it's because her baseline is that of abundance. And I realized that if I can just pretend that I didn't like that, maybe there are some benefits. So I now, like I said, do an impression. And I would offer it to say, I don't think you can convince yourself completely, but there are behaviors and actions that come from that mindset that I think deliberately change how you approach these problems. Now, what is this idea of power? And I kind of want to get into it for a little bit. The idea here is that power as a, as a perhaps uh, an interesting definition, one I recently learned, is the ability to change another person's reality. And I think that there could be folks on this call where your reality has been dramatically changed by another person, perhaps through email, perhaps one morning, perhaps through a project. It also could be true that you have the ability to change another person's reality for the next six months over email, through a phone call, through an in-person meeting. If you have that power or are affected by it, I think it's critical for us to be more familiar with the phenomenon of power because it's going to show up not only in the work we do, but also how we respond to these questions around how projects get formed. The also, the, the other thing that comes along with understanding how power even shows up is I have yet to see situations where there is a perfect balance of power. It's rare, but it does occasionally happen. More often than not, though, in relationships between two or more parties, the phenomenon of something I would call power asymmetry is more common. Is anyone familiar with this phrase power dynamics or like, man, there was a lot of weird power dynamics in that room. I, I found that to be not that descriptive other than it just sounds like a horrible meeting. I found it to be more illustrative to say it had asymmetry. 
as in there was a lopsidedness of power in the room. That means it was highly concentrated with one or few, one or a handful of people, and everybody else had less. Often that is me. So to visualize how a symmetry works, I'm going to share this diagram. So there are those on a sharp side, on the right hand side, and there are a bunch of people on the left hand side. Being on the left means you have more power than those on the right. So being on the sharp side could be uh, a look at a role that one is playing or a phenomenon that you find yourself in. So if anyone here has ever started a project and from the very first second, you can tell, oh my God, I'm never getting out of this project of the life. Has anyone ever had that? Like you wake up and go, oh shit, how, what am I going to do? This is, I'm screwed. That is you at the sharp end of this power symmetry, which means there is somebody somewhere that is on the wide end of that somewhere else. Now, depending on who's, who's on this call, there could be people on both sides of the spectrum right now on the same call. So I just want to highlight it. Now, the thing that I found kind of surprising when you think about these relationships is that law enforcement detainees, doctors and patients, as you see all of them classically, is that so many of these relationships are sort of like set as a default distribution of power. We could talk about perhaps like the way in which there's a fictional hierarchy of human value set up in this country, uh, where you know there are like a very limited number of people who are at the very tippy tippy top. But when you think about how relationships tend to go, power asymmetry definitely shows up in them which is a question for us to work out, well, where do we show up as consultants in this work? Where do you think we show up across this spectrum? Now, what's ironic is that for a company like Greater Good Studio, I thought we were gonna be all the way to the right saying that, yeah, stick it to the man, like let's fight the power. Sadly, that is not true. We are all the way on the left-hand side aligned with those with power because we can't get contracts unless we are friends with them. Does that make sense? Which means that in our effort to do work, to fight for those who are on the sharp end of asymmetry, we are necessarily aligned with those on the left. Now, in some situations though, what is worth highlighting is that in some cases, the project is only going to highlight the asymmetry and possibly even make things worse because of us. In those cases, we have to say no. So when one works in asymmetry, as a consultant, which I think is particularly present, we have to ask the question, is our work acting in the shadow of someone else's power symmetry? And will we make it worse even though we got paid? I mean, that's at the crux of some of these big questions of like, should I take this work or not? But I found like adding power symmetry or power as a lens helped me diagnose, oh, this is why this project feels weird despite whether or not there's questions around like, can we do it and what's the scheduling and what's the scope of work? But at the root for me at least, why these questions became so uncomfortable is because they had power embedded in it. So what we found is that when saying yes, it affirms the asymmetry that is already in the relationship. Saying no will disrupt it. It is awesome and terrifying. But if you can do it, it just upends everything. Now you may have lost the project, but I find that any client we've ever done this to has never forgotten us. You'll be forever remembered as the person who said no. I don't know if that's a reputation you want necessarily, but it is a real doozy. So when I add the power of the lens of power on top of what we do, I realize, oh, this is actually kind of a radical thing because it reminds folks, you don't have to take these projects and neither do we, which changes our relationship to the project itself. Ah, uh, Evely says, how do you gracefully, I can't even keep up with all the, <laughs> all the comments and, and questions. So uh, Devin or Heather, if you see a question that I should be really paying attention to, please let me know. Um, I'm just trying to stay in flow here. So what I want to highlight next, and I'll actually get to that question that Evelis put in around how to, how to get there, uh, but I want to highlight the idea of, of, of the relationship we have as consultants. Clients on one side with designers or consultants on the other tend to play two roles. A lot of our clients come to us with questions and they expect us to have answers. Does anyone relate to this with this diagram? See themselves in there. 
What's implied is that every question is valid and every question requires an answer. And you may think, well, I'm the one that has one. No, not every question warrants an answer. Some questions are shit. Some questions are flawed. Some questions do not, should not be asked at this time. Not that whether, regardless of whether I have an answer, it is not appropriate for us to have this conversation right now. But when you have that relationship set as it is, it tends to imply that this relationship is built on an execution. I am here to not only answer, but to follow through with the answer that I have, which states that the question you have, you could brought to me as a client has been valid. What I actually am suggesting is that instead of executional relationships, we challenge them to work on to say, how do we show better judgment? Which means you might have to step out of the role you've been given, which is that of a consultant or a answer provider and say, why are we talking right now? Why would you call me six months ago? Why don't we just have this conversation in six more months? And to question that means to say, I think we might have a better chance at doing maybe the work you're implying to do, if you can apply a lens of judgment instead of simply execution. And what we've been finding is that when we can apply that lens to ourselves, which might in some cases implicate saying, sorry, jeopardize us getting paid. We're looking for a very particular kind of client. One that is based on a relationship around sharing power. That is brand new language to us. My, my co-founder said it just offhand. She goes, oh yeah, that's who the, we're looking for. We're looking for clients who share their power. I was like, where have you had that? Like you've been sitting on that for a week. Like she goes, yeah, I just did, just made it. I just like became clear to her that that is brilliant. Because until then I couldn't, I couldn't tell you why those relationships made sense. But we are truly seeking individuals who are themselves powerful, who are willing to let it go. That makes them automatically like unicorns. Because that's all what we are trying to do. <laughs> but we got to find people who are already there. That means one in a hundred, one in a thousand, maybe one in a million. So it goes back to the idea of business development as an energy conservation strategy. It means I should not waste my time with people who are not willing to share their power. Does that all make sense? George, some of the questions are around what does it look like once you say no? And I know you're going to go into the examples. Mm -hmm. And some of the questions are, you know, what does teaching and coaching look like? Or what are some of those questions that don't need to be answered? Uh, so one quick example, uh, we had a rather large bank, okay, come to us and ask specifically, we would like to be more present in a conversation around race and power. I said, really? And we want to do so like in the next three months. Really? So I asked the question as well, why are you doing this now? Because it's not like this hasn't been around for like 400 years. So like, what's going on? She goes, well, you know, we've been noticing that things have been changing. Yeah. And we think we should, you know, pay attention. What it came down to was actually, they said, what they realized is that there's now new black banks with black money funding, funding black clients. That's why they're paying attention. I thought, okay, I, at least I, you would answer me straight. But that's a very different context than the one they were presenting originally. So you have to fish out, and this is perhaps what the exercise will lead to, is what it will be the pertinent questions that are uncomfortable for you, but definitely uncomfortable for your client to ask because you're trying to work out what will let what will help me identify these unicorn clients. All right, I've got to keep going. I'm sorry. So let's take a quick look at what is a gotcha. Let's try to give you a definition. A defendable and explainable rationale behind each major decision you make. There will be a point where you might have multiple people depending on you about your decisions. And I have found that in the places where I've worked, where there is no explainable rationale or defendable, it is incredibly confusing to work there. And what I ended up finding as a consultant in, my, in the space that I worked in was that I felt like I was at the mercy of whoever was pimping me out at whatever rate I was being pimped out at. It's very unsettling. Whereas if I knew that there was a gut check or something that was readable, let's say at the very, at the very least, I would have a better sense for like, what kind of next six months would my life look like? A gut check is not on the other hand, a way to confirm your pre-existing assumptions that lead to more self-deception. You can hack this tool if you want, 
and it will just lead to more of your own self hate. It's not going to help you. I can't stop you from doing that. But I would like you to try to take this with some candor because I think it could help you uncover questions that could uh, otherwise be hard to answer. So I'll skip that. So let's say if we say no, here's an actual description. And this is actually the very first breakup email I ever did. We've done, I've been keeping track of, we've done about 31 breakup emails the last 10 years. So a breakup email might look like this, dear blank. Thank you for taking time to answer our questions yesterday in response to our email. Unfortunately, we've come to the conclusion we will not be submitting after all. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So thank you for the opportunity, respectfully all. So this was the very first breakup email. Uh, it was done with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for a $100,000 RFP. Absolutely mind-bogglingly terrifying. I spent a whole eight hours rewriting this email because I couldn't believe we were actually going to do it. I was actually going to turn down the largest health-focused public health foundation in the country. I was like, you are nuts. I even sent a prior email to my client contact there, just apologizing. I'm really sorry I'm going to do this to you and us. Please don't hate me. Then I wrote this letter. What I found is that I'm now having done it over 30 times. Uh, it hasn't gotten any less scary, but there is a there is a, a sort of method here that I wanted to share. It looks like this. Up front, you say, thanks, of course. Then you immediately tell them no. Don't wait till the end and dick around. Then you say, it's not you, it's me. Then give explanation with bullet points. Give actual detail. If you hide behind, I don't have capacity or it's not a good fit. Nobody learns anything, especially you. The act of having to write down specific details as to why you can't do this project clarifies for you and your team what you stand for. Having, oh, we don't have capacity, it's not a good fit. It can still be true, but it doesn't allow you to work out, well, what is the line that I'm trying to score? And it is helpful if you can stay friends to say, I hope that I can provide service for you in the future. Okay, we're not trying to say, go with yourself. We're saying, I'm gonna be as utterly professional as I can be. And in doing so, I hope you can respect the terms that we have provided. Now, the other component, which I think is almost like a precursor to working out around the gut check itself, is what kind of project are we really doing? I find this to be fascinating. And I really wanted to highlight this because I think the chances of getting this almost like misdiagnosing prop, uh, the question is really critical because sometimes clients will come to you with something they have misread that you then have to execute and find out to your, to your chagrin, it's the wrong project. So we see four kinds of projects, but often our clients think there's only really one kind. So I'm gonna present a two by two, okay? If you're not familiar with two by two, it's basically two axes, but it says in this case, when you have clarity of the answer on one end of an axis through to, I have no idea what the answer is, you can put down a project. Conversely, if you put down on the other axis, how well do I understand the question through to I don't know what the question is at all, means there are four quadrants. Most clients come to consultants in the bottom left-hand corner and they're asking you, do it, monkey, do it. Like, do it now. We would suggest that many types of projects come our way that are misread, that actually exist in the spaces of the other three, where they have an answer, but they don't really understand what the question is. They sometimes have a great question, but don't know what the answers are. And my favorite is when someone would actually admit they neither know the question nor the answer. I think that's actually how our studio and what is built to do. I'm gonna label these. So in the bottom left-hand corner, we call those execute. Our studio tends not to do them much. I'm gonna treat the other two as the same. We're gonna just call them experiment. And my favorites, but rare, are these explore projects. Once you have a name for them, I just find them helpful. And I'll give examples. So uh, in the clear answer, we had a client called 826 National, and I'll show the example right here, where they knew they needed to have a digital strategy. They knew they needed to have a, a website for uh, reading and literacy but they didn't really understand, could answer the question of like, well, who's it for? How will they use it? What do they do when they get there? And to what end? That's a good example of, of a answer that doesn't have good questions. or well, the questions are still unclear. I love those projects. Those are great, okay? That is almost a little bit aligned to maybe how designers sometimes work. 
like we know we have to have a thing we're just not sure what the thing does what it's for who it's for makes sense right on the opposite corner when you have great questions the question in this case for a group called reading emotion they want to know how do we become more sustainable in our impact knowing that the work we do tends to degrade once we leave that school so like, okay, well, I don't know what the answer is, but the answers turned out to be new programs and services, a new teaching model, and in some cases, new business models. That's almost like a classical client relationship. A great question that is now seeking answers. Make sense? But my favorites, it's when someone will actually say, we can't stand it the way it is, and the world cannot, we can't bear it any longer. But we don't know what the question is or the answer. We just know we can't stand it this way. So that type of project we treat very carefully. And in this case, it was through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation around what will it take to, to basically have a community set their own conditions for what they believe they need and then have the capacity to actually answer it themselves. That is a really complicated project. So we end up doing this project called RaisingPlaces.org. You can go see that online where we outline the entire process engaging six communities around the country. But we find that across all the 150 projects we've done, they map to those three quadrants and very rarely do they do the execute. If we've ever done an execute, it's because we've already gone through some of the earlier sections. So if you look at this, there's also another lens of power that can be placed on this. What happens you see is that there's a power gradient here. Those who are in that top right quadrant are really willing to admit their their unsureness, they can admit they don't know, and actually be, again, willing to share their power. Those who want us in the bottom left-hand quadrant are more often pretty, pretty sure they want to keep the power they have. They're not super excited about sharing it with us. They're not super excited about sharing it with anyone else. So that's why I wanted to highlight this sort of like visualization, because it maps, again, it aligns to the power lens that we talked about earlier. But I'm going to ask is that we go to now this like reflective moment. I've been talking a lot, uh, but I'm going to do a little screen share and kind of highlight a little, a few of the steps that we're going to be doing together. So we're going to be kind of balancing our time between the screen share and your and mirror. So what I want us to do is I want to see if we can take stock of all the projects that you've worked on over the last 12 months. A project in this case, when you're asking, hey, what's the project? Well, it's bigger than an email, but smaller than a book. Okay, something that probably required a certain amount of time, may have involved other people, and wasn't trivial. At the same time, it's not doesn't have to just be like project work or paid work. It can be like a, a grad application, uh, helping your sister move across the country. It could be like getting ready for someone's baby shower. Whatever that took energy and effort, it's fine. Okay, what it may look like is that we may end up with a big set of like an inventory of all the projects you've done. When you think about these projects going back last, last 12 months, not only has everything been on a pandemic, but we had a madman in the, in, the, in the White House for so long, it may feel like the last 12 months has been like 14 years. So that may seem unfair. But if you are struggling, uh, maybe keep a calendar open and just look back over the last several months, like what were you doing? What has taken up all your time over the last 12 months? basically want to end up with our own data. Now, this is a reference to maybe how we might have otherwise done like research and design synthesis, but we don't have time for all that. We're just referencing your lived experience. You know, you've definitely, your body has gone through 12 months worth of shit. So what was that shit? It probably constitutes a number of projects you've done. And I'd love to have those to be named. What we're looking for is at least six. I, 12 is great. 20 would be awesome. More than 20 is probably too much. So what you'll see is that you'll have now an array of projects that have names, which is great. That's all we needed right now. Um, the only thing that we want to try next is try to see if you can create three new post-its that are in a different color. Um, there are multiple ways where you can do that. But if you look on the left-hand side of the mirror board, you'll see like a little thing that helps you make new post-its. I want you to see if you can label these post-its in three ways. One's called yes, all day, every day. Second is maybe, but here are my conditions. And the last one is nope, never again, or over my dead body. I think you can tell where this is going. So upon making those three new post-its, can you now please sort all the projects you just listed into those three categories? 
Now, this distribution of like a couple of yeses, a bunch of maybes, and a few noes may not reflect your reality. Totally fine. Please just align yourself and use your own gut instinct, your own how your body responds to like when you remember that project, do you really want to go through that again? Or does it give you joy? You know, like that Marie Kondo thing where it goes like, this is bringing me joy. Sure, then put it in the yes. If it's bringing you dread though, that's a sign. And I want us to be conscious of that too. Uh, I'm curious to know if you, in that exercise, noticed anything uh, amongst the placements. Was anything a surprise, for instance? Or did it confirm everything you already suspected? I'm curious if anyone's already there yet, if you notice anything about just how that felt for you. One of the surprises for me is that one of our largest jobs, I kind of had to put in the no category. Like mm. it's not a solid no, but in looking at it, it was like, yeah, we probably should have said no to that. Looking back on it in, upon reflection. Yeah. Is it surprising because you thought it should have been better than it turned out to be? Yeah. Okay. Because the like the theoretical alignment is there, mm -hmm. but it was one of those where the we kind of convinced ourselves that the bureaucracy was going to oh. be not as bad as it turned out to be. We were like, we're working with a small part of the company. It's not going to be that bad. Like mm -hmm. we're going to. How bad be can it be? Yeah. Yeah, I've done that many times. Has anybody else done that sort of like narrative or justification or post-rationalization and it bites you in the ass? I want us to capture that phenomena of both the rationalization and the data that says it was different than we were hoping for it to be. They're both valid. I can't I don't shame anyone to think they had a hard time, but rather if we don't take a lesson from it, how likely is that going to happen to us again? Because it could be, Sarah, if you don't mind me highlighting, that the, there are characteristics about that organization and that phenomena that will likely show up in a different company, in a different organization, that will trap you again. Oh, yeah, you we think, have seen it coming. We saw it coming. Okay, okay, this is great. Hi, this is Raman. Um, Hi. Something I noticed was that I, I it can, like sort of taught me that I really love building stuff and giving it away to the community as open source. And okay. that's kind of dominated my yes column. Um, that was a, that was something that came up for me. Did you did you see that before? Or that that was new to you. I think it was always so tied up in like anxiety about like wanting to get exposure and like I didn't realize how much I genuinely like it. Looking hmm. back on it. So the data is often there, but we spend so little time reflecting because it, this country is pathologically incapable of reflection. We are so so predicated on crushing it all the time, like hashtag crushing it that to reflect would seem like you're going backwards. No, it's how we get proportion. To slow down, I think as we heard from one of the very first speakers who, who spoke up earlier, to slow down and to change the pace of our work actually is energy conservation. You gain enormous speed by being more careful about how you spend your energy. Raman, thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad. Um, maybe let's have one more. Anybody else notice something in there? Yes, no, maybe. Um, hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Nipuni. And um, my husband and I, we recently graduated and just started consulting work. He's also a designer. Mm. And what I realized was the projects that I put in, in the yes category, like, as you said, are the projects where I had the power in my hands. Either it was because um, a co, uh, like a colleague or, or a collaborator was so clear in their expectations that it was so easy to figure out what they were, mm. or it was because um, it was an initiative that we took as opposed to a project that was given to us, which mm -hmm. are dominating my no category. Yeah, it's, it seems like perhaps the lack of autonomy mm -hmm. is, a, is a characteristic. Yes, and also the lack of setting proper expectations. Mm. Uh, from both parties, which led to disastrous um, <laughs> negotiations, negotiations late, later sure, on. Sure. Yeah. Now, as, as folks are hearing, thanks so much, Nipuni. Yeah, um, sure. As you're hearing other people speak, um, don't feel bad that you didn't have the same uh, uh, sort of pattern. But if you note that, like, huh, that sounds like a pretty good sign. Like, missed expectations would sound like will probably trip me up too. 
I should make note of that. That's fine too. I mean, I think that what we've done is uh, made such a generous spirit in this room and suddenly having so many people in these boards means that we are openly sharing so that we can learn from each other. All right, I'm gonna share my screen one a couple more times um, and get back to a couple more steps. And I'm gonna, I think again, we've been already intuitively to been doing this, but I want us now to see, can I check, you can see the slides? Yes, great. Now we're gonna to try to see if there are themes or potential patterns hiding within the clusters of work you've already put into sorted groups, okay? So within the yes, no, maybe, they might already be a couple of highly identifiable markers that go, oh, that, that's what I wanna see more of. And we've already been talking out loud about what some of those indicators are, those clues. The challenge now is to work out how do we take that, like, that bright spot that we see and turn it into a written theme. So I'm gonna share some examples of what that looks like. It could be that in my yeses, I enjoy having autonomy, making impact, and that I get to choose my team. This is just me making this up, so don't worry about the example. In the maybe category, it could be that they, if I could just have a more realistic timeline and the deliverables are more in my wheelhouse, then sure, it wouldn't have been so bad. But in the no category, man, it's really lonely. It feels like busy work. And frankly, these, these problems are kind of trivial. They keep showing up as like a phenomena. What I would love for you to do now is create three new post-its right alongside your yes, no, maybes and write language, perhaps even a sentence. You can write as many post-its as you want that describe what is the phenomena you see present in your clusters of yes, no, maybe. What would be descriptive? And we've already, in, as, as we were just talking out loud, we're already seeing folks be able to do that when asked, tell me what is happening in your cluster. So if you could spend some time now doing that, please, writing again, perhaps in a different color if you wish, descriptive language that gives more detail than the clumsy yes, no, maybe. We're getting greater fidelity. That is the phenomenon we notice, which is when good projects get ruined by terrible people or terrible clients. And let's not get those confused because you can be distracted by a great opportunity ruined by terrible assholes. And in working with them, it actually ruins the project too. But it should have been so great. Oh, this would have had so much impact. How could you get to that type of impact when you're stymied by these bozos? We have to take into consideration those relationships. We have to consider how it's gonna impact you and your energy. Those people, those terrible people, can always find someone to do that work. It doesn't have to be you. And sometimes what you can do is you say, I'm sorry, but we missed the opportunity to work on that project, but I'm conserving my energy for the next one that is going to be right. Can someone else share? I think we had maybe Pam, were you, were you gonna speak? I think you're taking yourself off. I found that I had three projects that I really get a lot of fulfillment from. They have mm. a lot of deep impact. Mm. So I really enjoy that. There's some kind of mundane stuff in the middle it's kind of like it's necessary, it's okay. I'm really good at it, do it in my sleep kind of thing, but I don't really get a lot out of it. Mm. And I took on a part-time job and I really don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> okay, so that's in a no? So the mundane, yeah, the no was kind of mundane things that I just really am tired of doing. Fair enough. I'm sure others are recognizing themselves in some of these characteristics. Petition plus project plus client. It's all part of a matrix. Um, Okay, so let, let, me, let me move on. Um, I think we already now got some interesting themes, which I'm hearing, so, which are fantastic. Um, at this exact moment, what we could say is, what a nice exercise we just went through. It's great. We did some reflection and now we have a body of, of knowledge. That's great. We could just leave it there. I think it would be more fun though to take it one more step and try to see if we can turn this into a tool, not simply a, uh, a reflection. So what we can do with this data is actually say, we can be preemptive. Are you able to see the slides? Great. Based on the themes, let's try to see if we can write questions that surface the factors that matter. You've just outlined themes that are important to you, both in the negative and the positive, right? The challenge now is to write and almost reverse engineer a question that will help you determine what kind of factor that you just outlined and how it will show up or be absent in the project that's coming your way. 
So here's some examples. So the theme is I want my projects to have impact in the world. I just said out loud, I want deep impact or somebody, somebody said that impact is clearly matters. Well, what types of positive impact might come about as a result of my work? Let's just list it out loud. Can you be sure the answers are real? No, but is it worth asking? Absolutely. Either you can develop it, the answer yourself. You could even ask this of the client, but just to state it out loud, clearly this matters to me. So let's talk about the stuff that matters. Another example, I hate it when my clients ignore my research. So let's make, let, what is, sorry, what makes us think they are interested or not in learning from me? Lauren, so this is maybe perhaps what we just talked about. What clues give me, give me a faith that they will follow through on a really risky but impactful project? If there aren't many clues, you kind of may already have your answer right there. And then maybe one more. I never have time to make final design refinements. So the question is, if the timeline doesn't allow a final refinement, how can we set expectations for the final deliverable? The tip here was try to write questions if you can now, based on those themes that you can't answer with a yes or no. It's the same as saying, please write open-ended questions. Can everybody now try to convert each one of those themes that originally was yet yes, no, maybe, into then themes, now each corresponding open-ended question. Yeah, Charlene, this is exactly the problem. Uh, as I said, it's hard to come up with open-ended versus yes or no's. The reason we, we're discouraging yes or no, isn't that it's helpful to have a yes or no answer, is that it means that we may limit our ability to engage in a conversation with them or with ourselves about what that answer might be the more rhetorical sometimes those questions are, actually the more revealing they'll be about what the nature of the relationship is that we're discussing. Is anyone willing to share maybe a question that they uh, developed? If you have more than one, that's even better. I can share. Um, oh, thank you, hi. Hi, Aisha, again. Um, a lot of my themes were around um, disrupting and, dismantling systems of oppression and like the ways in which um, we perpetuate structural violence through our work within organizations. And so my questions were, um, in what ways do you disrupt and dismantle systems of oppression? Um, in what ways are you building or creating alternative systems and futures that advance justice and liberation? Um, also some of the themes were around willingness to be challenged. So. I also asked, how do you feel about being challenged around the ways white supremacy shows up in your practice? Um, and how do you reflect on, <laughs> yeah, I'll stop. No, no, what was the last one? I'll cut you off, I'm uh, sorry. The last one was, how do you reflect on the ways you harm others and reinforce or perpetuate structural racism, homophobia, and other forms of structural violence? Damn, those are hardcore. Um, what's your, how, how might you, how do you plan on using those? Like all at once, once a year, like those are not trivial questions. Do you feel, and here's maybe another way of interpreting these gut check. I wonder if this isn't necessarily about frame these questions to be like a survey to be taken mm -hmm. by the client. I, I think that that's probably less productive because mm -hmm. most people are not ready for those questions, regardless of what they, how, no matter how much work they've done. Yeah. If you could reflect upon those questions and ask her for yourself, mm. how did my client show up in this regard? When I think about, uh, do they seem ready for change? Mm -hmm. Which is the question you wrote. What would my yeah. response be reflecting on my 30, 60 minute call or my last two months together? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, perhaps there's a clue. They seem hesitant, but it seems to be nervousness around like old past trauma, like whatever the answer might be, mm -hmm. this is a tool that could be reflective again upon a, almost like a debrief. As you debrief on, a, on, a, on an initial call with a potential client, these questions are so instructive to goose out from you what you picked up from the call. Mm -hmm. But I think if you treat it like a survey, it kind of doesn't, it doesn't work in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. does, that ever, does that make sense to folks? Can someone else maybe share? Thank you so much, Ayesha. I can share my Hi. questions. This is Charlene in Hi, Charlene. Um, North Carolina. She, her, hers. And um, I actually wrote my questions more sort of 
um, for my own decision making. I guess what you're kind of what you're saying, um, and they were really um, around kind of how much control I could have over the the situation the the project. So um, how do I how do I have enough control over my schedule and timelines, and and um, how can I build enough support to do the project that I don't feel alone and frustrated? Mm. Um, and how can I ensure that the results will be worth the effort? And then um, there was one more. But and what can what can be negotiated so the expectations aren't unreal, unrealistic? This is so great. How do you feel about that, Shoni? Um, <laughs> I was actually texting with someone else who is on this. Um, <laughs> real time, real time prototype. Yeah, real time, it. because there's a project coming up that I am um, sort of so ambivalent about, and this is making me even more ambivalent about it. And it's hard because it's something that I have the skills for. It needs to be done. It's really important work. And I will not have control over this, my schedule and the timeline because it's state funding. And so it's oh, really hard. So all those, all those characteristics are all true. You're a great fit for it. I, it you know, would be really good. It will fit my own schedule. Uh, this work is really important. I want to demote those characteristics, not from their truthfulness, but their match for you as a person with respect to the gut check you just created. Right. It could be independently true. Those things are all true, but still a bad fit for you. Right. And I think sometimes we swap those around and say, well, it is inherently a good project. No, <laughs> it, it's, it's, that can be fine, but is it a good match for you? Means you have to know what your boundaries are. And the more right. we can define those boundaries, not only does it give you power, it helps you keep and conserve the energy you have. Because here's what I found to be so true. The project that is perfect is hidden from view because we're distracted by those bullshit projects we end up distracting ourselves with. Right. They become so much harder to detect because we're busy and distracted with all these other shenanigans. We have been right. really fortunate in this, in this last 10 years of getting really good at finding the project we want. Because I have the time to do it, because I'm not distracted by too much of the other stuff. It's a, it was like a paradox to me that I would be more available for the projects I want only because I'm not doing so much of the nonsense. It's a privilege, but actually it's a designed outcome. I didn't think you could, but I, I'm happy to tell you it's, it's been happening. It's awesome. And the, the sort of the, the positive cycle, the, the cyclical nature of becoming better at it means that your portfolio then reflects more of what you want to get. It actually gets easier. It's gotten easier. Can I hear maybe from uh, another another example of a set of questions um, that they developed? This is uh, Chuck Brown Hi. Uh, in Oakland, Olenny Land. I'll just I'll just share one question, which I think has been working well for me. Although I'm going to keep reflecting on it now uh, through this exercise. But uh, something I always ask folks is like, where does your life story, your own experiences intersect with the problem that you're laying out here. And then you're asking me to come on board with, because I feel like, I mean, if they, if it doesn't intersect clearly, then that's an obvious no, right. That sure. they've got no real connection to the challenge. So what are we, what are you, why are you getting involved and, and why are you bringing me in? Um, but also so if you're, if you're only interacting with it from the position of having all the power, right. You're just, you've, you've, you've interacted with it from the top down, or, you know, you showed that great graphic on asymmetry. Uh, you're also not a good fit because you don't understand and you don't, you can't really relate to what, you know, what we're even really trying to address. And so, and that may not be just the, in the individual, right? You, you try to look at the team, right? So that's another question. Who's, who's on your team and who's involved in decision-making? Because there's, there's possibility that you'll get other perspectives in there. But, but yeah, if it doesn't intersect with your own life story, and if you've already interacted with the challenge from the top down, I think it's, those are very clear signs to me that it's probably not going to be a good fit for us. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to try one last step. Okay. Let's share my screen one last time. And this is just a simple question. Let's try to see if we can stress test this. I actually think we had 
uh, someone t- doing it almost live uh, as we were a second ago with a, a text message with a colleague. Can you please think of a project that you have just a rumor of right now, but like a homing missile is bloody heading your way. You can tell already it's like got your name all over it. Either that project is filling you with joy and excitement, also like muted or go, oh God, that dread, that dreadful feeling like that Monday, Monday blues feeling. Those feelings were always there, but those feelings are deceptive, they're clumsy, and they're not that rigorous. We have a gut check now. Can you please run that project, the room of the project, through the questions that you just wrote, and then place it somewhere on your spectrum of yes, no, maybe, and then compare and just be willing to share it if you could. Could you try and do that exercise, please, with the, something that's heading your way? There's always something heading your way, isn't there? <laughs> Sometimes you go, oh, wait, this is it. This is better than I always knew I loved this one. You can actually pursue it faster now. You can put more energy towards it. If it isn't something, let's find out right now. Would someone be willing to share their upcoming project opportunity, both good, middling, or, or bad, and tell us what happened when they run it through their prototype gut check. I think there's a question here, Nicole. I'm curious, have you ever used these questions around these you identified in the yes, don't inform rather explicit content, uh, say in an RFP? Nicole, could you speak to this? I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just curious, you know, these questions uh, and the sort of the underpinning values that we identified when we went through the, the yes, maybe no. Um, it struck me that one could uh, include some of these questions or statements about, you know, the organization's values in something like an RFP, um, which might be a little bit outside of the box of a, of a normal RFP content. But uh, have you ever, uh, when you're going for projects, have you ever used these questions to help a client choose you? Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that we do our best to avoid RFPs because by that point, it's too late. So our business development strategy is about helping people write RFPs, not respond to them. It's yeah, way too enough. late. And so much of white supremacy culture turns into bullet points in an RFP. It's a nightmare. What we tend to find, if we think about the relationship between question and answer again, or that two, that two by two, Many RFPs have so many assumptions baked into it. And because it's written in Word, in the formatted sense, it basically says, I'm not brokering a conversation about how valid these questions are. That gives me a lot of concern about how, whether or not we're going to fit in. So Mm -hmm. it is true. You could probably use it as a form of response to an RFP, but I would get kind of concerned that it's too late. So our our, business development strategy is about starting relationships possibly years before they're ready for an RFP which is why I tend to use this whole, like I use a language around, let's have a sounding board where there's no pretense of responding to an RFP. I'm just gonna be a good listener. So when they are ready to have an RFP, it's obvious that we should be on it. And ideally we could help write it because our questions are gonna be really good. And so for our answers will be too. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not yeah. trying to avoid your answer, your, your question. I just find that sometimes the RFP is almost like it's really difficult to get out of it, to, to no, respond yeah. thoughtfully. Yeah, I appreciate the way you're putting it. I think it clarifies some of my gut feelings as well. Thanks. Yeah, like it may be the wrong question for <laughs> the wrong one for you to answer. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So we're coming up to time. Um, you guys have been great. <laughs> so great. I wish this could have been done in person. I really miss being in person. Uh, all this uh, Zoom uh, and sort of the science of Zoom and like waiting for people to get this off. Oh, it's so awkward. I just I just miss being in person. Uh, but I do think that uh, what I'm seeing in the chat and, and sort of how thoughtfully people have been responding to the, to the prompts have been so good. Uh, I just appreciate all the time and energy you've put into it. Um, do, does anyone willing to share maybe some final reflections or, or thoughts that they're going to be leaving away with? Um, I'd love to hear anything as we as we start to wrap up. Hi, my name is Cassidy. Um, I'm a I'm a graduate student, um, and I just wanted to say that, like more than anything else, I feel really encouraged because I've been feeling like 
a lot of dread about going out into the working world and having to face the realities of like so much scary stuff. So it's really encouraging to hear from everyone and see that like there are people that like really care about these things and they're doing really wonderful work and asking wonderful questions. So yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks, Cassidy. Thank you. Yeah. I'll share a takeaway. Hi. Hi, George. It's Jyoti here from Seattle. Hi, Jyoti. Um, loved the session. Um, some of my key takeaways include the codification of a gut check process. Like the, the concept of gut check has entered my purview um, and become more and more important recently. Um, and I just love the, the process, like how you took this nebulous idea and broke it down. Um, and these questions that, that I've crafted in response to you know, evaluating potential projects, I, I did, I did uh, intend to use them um, because I think they could really help me find the right type of work. So thank you. Thank you for taking us through that. I learned about process and I also have these questions that are super valuable. So, yeah. That's so well, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Jody. Thanks for speaking up. Yeah, I mean, this is, I get so much satisfaction seeing people build tools for themselves. Uh, and I think you notice that everyone's questions are uniquely theirs. Giving, having me give you mine wouldn't make any sense and it wouldn't, wouldn't land the same way. But if you could develop it based on your own lived experiences, it means to me that everything you went through was worth it. There's value sitting there in everything you went through, all the shitty things you went through and all the great things you went through. It was still worth it but it's only really worth it if you make yourself the time. So my big thanks, my big takeaway is just thank you for giving yourself two hours to go through something that otherwise would be so easily lost to all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world. Um, I'm going to say just thank you again uh, to Devin and uh, Heather for hosting this conversation. I know that she, they, these guys have built an amazing community of folks who are willing to try these uh, experiments with me and, and with the others. Uh, so thanks so much to them. Can I hand it back to you guys now? George, thank you. Like we talk about conserving energy and you have given us such an amazing gift of your energy and wisdom and talent and experience. And oh, it's just been a joy. It's awesome. And Devin, I'll let you take it away. I want to echo something that George said. And thank you, Heather. Um, George said, thank you for giving yourself this time today. So really that is reclaiming your power and thank you to George for allowing us to reclaim a lot of our power. I shared some topics of conversation that are happening over the next three months that Heather and I will be co-hosting with Possibility Project and she's sharing the screen so you can see it. They're super like meaty, whether it's mushroom meat or regular meat, <laughs> As a, um, activism and equity, disruptive design, lessons learned from the South, changing in philanthropy, black excellence and giving circles. Um, join us for those conversations. Follow George and Greater Good Studio. His work is phenomenal. And this is a community of practice. So let's lean on each other. You can join our LinkedIn group. We are super active in chatting there. And I look forward to crossing paths with you all again real soon. So thank you so, so much for this time and, and all you do in the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Take good care.